11. And this is going to be a continuation, again, of uh, Salvifici Dolores. This is uh, also a continuation, Suffering and the Imago Dei. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so I've learned to go over in this class, so I think probably the best way to do it is, is for me to try to talk uh, straight through without interruption, but then uh, in the... Um, but then after uh, lunch, uh, before Roland's uh, Roland Malaria's uh, talk, um, uh, then uh, I'll, I'll be able to take some time for question and answer. Uh, Roland, uh, how does that how does that sound? Is that okay. Okay. You and A for an hour and a half. <laughs> no, I want I want to hear your talk, and and and, 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 and since I'll be speaking about Mary, I think what what you have to say about about Mary will will help uh, to to supplement uh, what what I'll be sharing. So so uh, we're going to talk about how John Collins Salafici Dolores develops the Second Vatican Council's doctrine regarding the the image of, of God in, in the human person. Uh, and uh, before we do that, I want to talk about how John Paul speaks of the Imago Dei in his Catechesis on Human Love. Um, because I'm going to also show that he's developing what he says in the Catechesis on Human Love in Psalm of Feature Dolores. So, uh, so I'm going to be um, using some terminology that comes from a book by uh, Yaroslav Kupchak. Uh, the book's called Gift and Communion, and it's on John Paul's catechesis on human love. And in this book, um, Kupchak, Kupchak uh, identifies three main ways of understanding uh, the Imago Dei that are uh, put forth in, in the Catechesis on Human Love. These three main ways of understanding the Imago Dei, the image of God in the human person, are understanding it in terms of the structural image of God in the human person, the relational image of God, and the uh, communal or the communal dimension. These are actually better, better understood as dimensions. So, uh, so these these can be thought of as present in three dimensions. And so, uh, John Paul, um, now a structural understanding of the Imago Dei, uh, according to, to Kupchak, uh, this would attempt to find and isolate the that dimension of human nature which differentiates, di differentiates the human person from the animals and which makes him to be the image of God. Uh, now, in the uh, Catechesis on Human Love, uh, so this is all, here we're speaking, all from the Catechesis on Human Love, which, as I mentioned, is the official name of um, of the theology of the body. So, in the Catechesis on Human Love, John Paul identifies the structural um, aspect, or if he locates a structural aspect of the Emmanuel Day. in um, the human experience of original solitude. Um, I think that John Paul 
coined this term, although it's probably present in other ways, in other writings. In fact, I'm sure it is. Um, but for John Paul and his catechesis on human love, um, original solitude is the experience of the first man as he becomes conscious of himself as a unique and unrepeatable subject. Now, uh, we don't have time to um, read this from the Catechesis of Human Love, but if you're looking in your reader and you want to read about this uh, later on, this is under Readings for Session 10. Uh, so um, towards the end is the reader, about you know, maybe 20 or 30 pages from the end. And in the general audience of October 10th, 1979, that's where John Paul talks about about um, about original uh, original solitude. So it's um, I, I think I think we can apply this to the uh, the human uh, experience of. of being an I, that there is a, there is a me who thinks and wills and, and, and feels. And that, um, that can be said that the human experience of, of individual uh, personhood can be said to be the image of, of God, who is a person who knows and, and wills. Um, now, I actually have not taught um, in the past or written a lot about original solitude, so I just want to double check since we have experts here who have taught uh, about it. Is this an accurate way, uh, Stephen, uh, Dr. Hitten, Dr. Mark, Dr. Hittinger, uh, is this? An appropriate way of describing original solitude? I think so. I mean, this is before, I think, that isn't this even before the creation of Eve? Right. This is described. So the original solitude is having those powers of the soul that we talked about in yesterday. Yes. Intellect and will. Yes. That's the image of God. Yes. Because God, if we read that passage from Aquinas, the fact that we have a word in our soul. And the love that proceeds from our will, mm -hmm. we are an image of God. But you see, that could just be a philosopher sitting in his room, or even the, my grandchild listening to Alex. <laughs> Both of you know, the dawning of intelligence and the love of the good. And yes. that's what, yeah. And Kupchak, this is some great work. He's a Dominican. Mm -hmm. And he, he sees John Paul goes beyond St. Thomas. I mean, it's consistent with it, but it's, it is a development. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, so that's the, 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 the structural uh, understanding of the Imago Dei. I'll leave this up here for, for now and uh, move on over here. So then we have the <coughs> relational understanding of the uh, Imago Dei. And uh, Kuchet says that, um, that John Paul II puts forth the relational understanding in his catechesis on human love through applying St. Paul's distinction between the first Adam and the last Adam, who is Christ, the perfect image of God. Um, John Paul, or actually, no, this is um, Kupchak summarizing John Paul. Um, man, for, for John Paul, a man who is created in the image of God can understand and realize his eternal destiny in life only by becoming similar to Christ the Redeemer, imitatio Christi which is possible only through the grace of redemption. Likeness to Christ will find its fulfillment in the eschatological mystery of the resurrection. Uh, so, so that's kind of 
check uh, summarizing uh, summarizing John John Paul. And Can you please um, say that again. Oh, oh, I, oh, I certainly will. I'm going to write it write oh, about okay. it. Uh, so, so for John Paul, man who is created in the image of God can understand and realize uh, his eternal destiny in life only by uh, becoming similar to Christ, uh, the, the, the Redeemer, uh, in the Tatsio Christi, which is possible only through the grace of redemption. Likeness to Christ will find its fulfillment in the eschatological mystery of redemption. So the relational in Lazo Day is the human person, man or woman, um, finding uh, finding his uh, her identity through uh, through being brought into a relationship, a give and take relationship with the crucified and risen Christ. Uh, so, uh, if we were speaking in more traditional Dominican terms, we would see that. Um, that uh, the structural um, imago Dei is is uh, is in man's capacity for knowledge and love. That's intellect and will. And the relational aspect of the imago Dei. Um, Again, this is like the traditional understanding, the mystic understanding, and uh, this is what John Paul says in his own words in the Catechesis on Human Love, is it's experienced through knowing and loving God. And what John Paul brings to it is that this is, we know and love God through Imitatio Christi through the imitation of Christ, because it's in um, in being redeemed by Christ <coughs> and receiving His grace that that we um, imitate Him, and this imitation of Him, following His His cross, um, is um, as I was saying earlier, it's not a simple imitation like I might imitate. The way someone, the way someone talks or walks. This is an imitation that actually um, molds us and shapes us, so that we might become another Christ, alter Christus. And then there's the communal aspect of the Imago Dei. Um, and this is something that's, um, for the most part, it's more recent than, than uh, Aquinas or other earlier doctors or, or fathers uh, of the church. Um, the communal aspect is what was um, really accentuated by Gavin at Spes uh, in, our, in 24, uh, the likeness that's that's the that's you know as we've heard several times um, uh, likening um, the likeness between the divine persons to the likeness of the baptized in truth and love and and this likeness reveals that man who is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself cannot fully find himself except through sincere gift of self so. If we're seeing how this communal aspect of the Imago Dei is present in the Catechesis on Human Love, um, John Paul develops the Council teaching um, concerning this using the language of uh, dynamism, presenting the image of God not just as something that man is, but also is something that man becomes. 
And uh, for this, we should take a look at uh, something that's in the reader. So this is in the, in the reader in uh, the general audience of November uh, 14, 1979. Uh, this is a very important passage in the catechesis on, uh, on human love. Um, here it is. It's, um, it's the second page of the November 14th audience. If you're looking uh, at um, the set, it's the, the um, second full paragraph of the one beginning, if vice versa. Um, he says, um, he's speaking on Genesis. This is what he's referring to when he says the Yahwist text. He's referring to uh, a text from from Genesis on the creation of man and woman. He says, we can then deduce that man became the image of likeness, the image and likeness of God, not only through his own humanity, but also through the communion of persons which man and woman form right from the beginning. Um, now, I think, uh, let me see, um, oh, here it is. He goes on to say, the function of the image is to reflect the one who is the model, to reproduce its own prototype. Man becomes the image of God, not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. Right from the beginning, he is not only the image in which the solitude of a person who rules the world is reflected, but also and essentially an image of inscrutable divine communion of persons. So he's making a, a subtle point here. He's saying that from the beginning of creation, when we have man in his original solitude, um, even uh, just in his in his um, knowing and loving, uh, knowing and loving God, just even apart from the human person's relationship with other human persons, we have in this knowing and loving God, this the structural relational dimensions of the Imago Dei, we have um, an image of uh, the entire uh, the entire Trinity which is God knowing and loving himself. Um, but uh, where we see this um, communal dimension of the Imago Dei, where it becomes um, visible for us, is in the union of human persons. And um, in popular talk about the um, about the catechesis on human love, the emphasis is on is on marriage. But you know, in terms of the baptized people who have the the heart of Christ, then it's not just marriage that through which the human person imitates the Trinity, but it's through but it's through every act of love between, between the persons. Uh, so just, you know, here we get to the entire, um, the entire holy hands. This is, this is all, this is all, you know, again, if you've ever seen uh, the thesis images of the, of the dance, you know, it, this is the, communion of saints through which we are all joined with one with one another um, in in Jesus Christ who brings us all to the love of the of the of the Trinity so um, so that would be the, the communal imago, imago Dei, the the, uh, the fact that we in our own person um, in, in knowing and loving God, we, we image the exchange of love in the Trinity and we can 
actuate this image, enter more deeply into it through, uh, through communion with one another. Uh, quick question, Ruben? Yeah, so is he, is John Paul II saying that this communion is what, is what actualizes it, or is it, is it the best manifestation of the Imago that already exists, or is it what makes us the image of God? Um, we have to be careful, and I'm glad you, you asked that. Um, there are some theologians who will take this so far as to say that, well, um, well you're not um, really the image of God on your own. In fact, uh, Dr. Hittinger's brother uh, gave a lecture, which I once, uh, which I heard, uh, uh, that's, ne that's since been written up into an essay, and the, the uh, title of the original lecture was, Can You Be the Image of God on Your Own? <laughs> and, uh, and the answer is, uh, for, for John Paul as well as the tradition, the answer is, is yes. But this image of God is made um, is made uh, visible through communion in, in much the same way that Jesus Christ makes visible uh, the the love of, uh, of of the Trinity. It's not to say that that the Trinity wasn't always knowing us, loving us, but in in Jesus Christ uh, we have we have. Um, the sign, the sacrament of God's love, which is in fact God's love, come to us, and uh, in a similar way—not identical, but a similar or analogous way—the communion of persons, um, be it through marriage, the sacrament of Christ, uh, of Christ in the church, uh, or just the communion of of the of the, the, back, the baptized, um, because we are speaking in terms of those who have the divine uh, indwelling through baptism, uh, that communion um, makes the image of God um, visibly uh, present. Uh, so, there, um, so there is meaning uh, in, um, in why in how God uh, chose to reveal Himself uh, through, um, in in in, in the, the first uh, human person um, revealing His His image uh, through through Adam, and then uh, revealing it in a in a um, more visibly uh, more visible way through the the love of Adam and Eve. Um, Dr. Hittinger, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Or well, just to put the, another piece in there, which it, it's so pervasive, you may not have mentioned it because it's assumed, but just to make it explicit, mm -hmm. the spousal meaning of the body is what this third dimension is all about. Yes. Right? That from the beginning, we understand we are made for the self-donation, the self-giving. So there's Gaudium et Spes 24. So the very meaning yes. of the body, male and female, is we are made to enter into communion, which is fruitful, Yes. of the communio personale. And then, I don't know if Christopher West misses this or not, but we can't forget that religious life is an eschatological witness to this communion of persons in heaven. And that Jesus on the cross, by opening the womb, you see, we become flesh of his flesh. So there's something greater than marriage. And St. Paul says this in Ephesians. Marriage is the great sign, but there's an even greater marriage, and that is the marriage with Jesus Christ under the cross. So I, I know that's throwing a lot out there. <laughs> um, that's very but that's, yeah, marriage and that union with Christ that we're all called to, and the, the religious give us a witness. See, that love and communion is beyond marriage. And actually, as Jesus told us, told the Sadducees, in heaven you will not marry or be given in marriage, because there's no need for it. We'll be in complete communion with the Trinity and with all the saints. So there won't be a need or reproduction, or even that intimacy on earth that is made possible and it makes visible 
<clears throat> that love and marriage. So sorry. Thank you. That's that's, that's, that's beautiful, and I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. And in Christopher West's defense, he does give talks to seminarians and religious, in which he does um, say some of the things that you were sharing that are uh, in John Paul. Um, but um, he, um, you know, his thing though is is based on. Um, largely on, on feeling. So when he talks about the religious, uh, the religious person, um, the, the celibate person and his or her union with God, he'll use that picture that was on the JP2 Forum website of the ecstasy of St. Teresa. Oh, yeah. and, and he'll uh, compare this to a kind of sexual ecstasy and say, oh, well, you see the sexual ecstasy that husband and wife get? The religious person gets this like St. Teresa, so you know that's even better. But it's like, no, that's not quite what we need. <laughs> we need marriage. That's why our last session will get to marriage. Yes. <laughs> the virgin and mother. It's the joy of the virgin and mother. Yes, that yeah. that is beautiful. That is yeah. beautiful. And, that, and actually, we're getting to that. Actually, right at this. Uh, this moment, so so maybe the Holy Spirit is telling me I'm moving a bit too slowly here because that is the next, uh, the very next uh, point of, with how these um, dimensions of the uh, Amado Dei are present in Salvifici Dolores, and in fact how Salvifici Dolores, uh, in a certain way, uh, completes and advances what John Paul uh, teaches in. His catechesis on human love uh, on the Imago Dei. Uh, so, uh, the first thing that we do need to admit is that there is no explicit mention of the doctrine of the Imago Dei in Salvifici Dolores. If you scan Salvifici Dolores and look for image of God, you won't find it. There, it there's, there, those words don't appear in it. But, um, where we do find the doctrine is in the apostolic letters, in, in Salafici Dolores' teachings on <coughs> Imitatio Christi. And you know, this is the case very often in theology where you, know, you might be looking for something like, where, is, where does uh, Augustine talk about divinization? There's a, a great book. Um, called uh, called the one the one Christ uh, by um, by Father David McConey, which is on Augustine's teachings on divinization, and Father McConey mentions that for for many years people thought that Augustine had no teaching on divinization because they would search his writings for talk about divinization and. The word wasn't there. Um, but in fact, if you start searching for the concepts of divinization and for other words that are related to divinization, like glorification, sharing in, in, in Christ's resurrection, then you find that there's this very robust teaching on divinization that runs all through uh, Augustine. Uh, so, so, you know, we can do this. Same thing with Imago Dei. We, we, we know that the Imago Dei relates to uh, the human capacity for, for, in, for, for knowledge and love. We know it relates, that's the structural Imago Dei. We know that uh, the relational Imago Dei relates to knowing and loving God, having our faculties of intellect and will engaged in knowledge and love of God. And we know that the communal as aspect uh, in, 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 in involves um, involves uh, knowing and love and, and, and loving God through um, through uh, imitation of God's uh, gift of gift of self in in human uh, relationships that uh, that uh, in their various ways image the love of the Trinity. Uh, at being divine communion persons. So where are these things in, in Salafici uh, Dolores? Uh, well, uh, first, with regard to 
the structural uh, and and uh, and relational aspects of the Imago Dei. What we will find in reading uh, Salvatore Dolores is that John Paul repeatedly and emphatically insists that Christ's intellect and will were completely set on suffering for the redemption of humanity. We saw this when we were talking about uh, John Paul's use of the song of the suffering servant in section uh, 18, where he says that um, the suffering servant takes on himself those sufferings uh, in a totally voluntary way. And he, and he goes on to say, Christ suffers voluntary, voluntarily and suffers um, innocently. Now, vol voluntarily, um, in the Latin, it comes, and John Paul's writing in Latin, it comes from, from voluntas. And if we were pronouncing, um, pr pronouncing uh, our Latin in the classical way, we would say, Voluntas, uh, and this is where we get the word will. Uh, so, so he and we get the intellect there too, because Christ uh, knows uh, knows that he is that he wants to redeem us, and he wills to redeem us. Um, so. Um, it's therefore precisely, you know, it's out of the Lord's. We see, we see that it's precisely in Christ's suffering that he reveals to man the perfection that man must imitate if he is to live up to the fullness of his own identity as Imago Dei and so share in Christ's resurrection. Um, so suffering um, reveals how we are to imitate Christ and so. And so, um, and so, fully um, actuate, engage the image of God within ourselves, and so t to be able to return to God His own image. Now, if the structural and relational, uh, the dimensions of the Imago Dei are supremely manifest in Christ's suffering, we might expect to find that the communal aspect of the Imago Dei is thereby manifest as well. But how can that be so, given that suffering is an intensely personal experience? Suffering, we experience it as the I, I suffer. So it's possible to answer that question by considering the implications of something that John Paul says that I believe we read earlier, or touched on earlier, in Santa Fici Dolores number 23, which I think is, let's see, if it's um, <coughs> um, page, um, okay, here we go. Um, yes, thank you, 58. So, uh, he says, um, here it is, um, the second full paragraph. Those who share in Christ's sufferings have before their eyes the paschal mystery of the cross and resurrection uh, in which Christ descends in a first phase to the ultimate limits of human weakness and impotence. Indeed, he dies nailed to the cross. Here we have again a reference implicitly to Philippians 2, verses 5 and 11. Namely, we have a reference to Christ's self-emptying, his humiliation. John Paul goes on, but if at the same time in this weakness there is accomplished his lifting up, confirmed by the power of the resurrection, then this means that the weaknesses of all human sufferings are capable, remember, capable, that's, um, that's you know, the Latin capax, like, like capax dei, our capacity 
for God, uh, which which um, is what makes us um, capable of receiving uh, the very presence of God and our baptismal grace. He says that the weaknesses of all human sufferings are capable of being infused. Uh, that's that's the Latin uh, infusio. Um, this is what we normally will see with regard to baptism, the infusion of grace. Um, the weaknesses of all human sufferings are capable of being infused with the same power of God manifested in Christ's cross. In such a concept, to suffer means to be particularly susceptible, particularly open to the workings of the salvific powers of God offered to humanity in Christ. In, in him, God has confirmed his desire to act, especially through suffering. So we are back again at John Henry, blessed John Henry Newman, his passion was an action. I do believe we read this passage the other day, but it to reread it to reread it now in light of what's been discussed. Um, uh, God has confirmed in him, in, in Christ, God has confirmed his desire to act, especially through suffering, which is man's weakness and emptying of self. That's the that's the kenosis of Philippians. Uh, this also explains the. Uh, then, he, then he goes. He goes on. Um, so now, keeping in mind what John Paul says about about suffering, enabling the sufferer to be particularly open, and I believe this we just read. I think. Salvation, Salvation of Lords 23. Um, now let's think of that with regard to the communal dimension of the Imago Dei. Um, and what will open this up for us is Salvation of Lords number 26 where John Paul talks about the first member of the church, the mother of the church, Mary. Uh, so we have this on um, page, um, page 73, or actually, let me see, is it? 73, maybe, actually, maybe it's not 26 that I'm looking at. And, um, 75. Um, okay, good. 75. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Thank you. It is, so it is section, section 26. Um, so uh, what we see here is that, well, first of all, I'll just read the passage. He says, he says, this is not all. The divine redeemer wishes to penetrate the soul of every sufferer through the heart of his holy mother. This is very interesting because, because we know that in Luke, I think it's the second chapter of Luke, um, someone Tell me what this represents. Sword of sword. 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 Yes, yes, that the sword will pierce will pierce your heart also. So so the sword um, first pierces Jesus' heart and and through piercing Jesus' heart pierces Mary, that of Mary his mother as well. 
Uh, so there's some very interesting food for reflection here that, that Jesus actually wishes to pierce us, the man and woman and every one of us, all of our hearts are to be pierced, penetrated through the heart of Mary. Um, and uh, that's, that's uh, supposed to be an M, it looks like half a heart. But, uh, but uh, so, so uh, he goes on to say, as though by a continuation of that motherhood which by the power of the Holy Spirit had given him life, the dying Christ conferred upon the ever Virgin Mary a new kind of motherhood, spiritual and universal, toward all human beings, so that every individual of faith might remain together with her, closely united to him unto the cross, and so that every form of suffering, given fresh life by the power of this cross, should become no longer the weakness of man, but the power of God. Very powerful. I mean, it sounds like the preface of a Eucharistic prayer or collect or something, or something, doesn't it? It sounds positively liturgical. So, we see that Mary, who is perfectly conformed to Christ, exemplifies being particularly open to, to the grace of God through suffering, because her suffering does not leave her in isolation, but rather brings her into a deeper union with Christ and with all who are in Christ. So, let's see. Could someone please um, erase this other side of the board for me? I'm going to do one more, or maybe one or two more, magnum two board uh, things. Thank you. I'm going to just uh, write out then how through Mary, John Paul is shedding new light on the structural, relational, and communal dimensions of the Imago Dei. And then I think we have just enough time to show how Pope Francis does this as well. So we can actually see the uh, interconnectedness between all three dimensions of the Imago Dei in Mary, the model of the suffering member of the faithful. So first we have the structural dimension. So so we have we have we have Mary and uh, and I'm just going to uh, just symbolize her by a big M. Mary. Now actually I'll, I'll draw her as a, as as a as a woman, I'll put her in a dress. That's the easiest uh, the easiest way to signify this is a human person with an immaculate heart and Mary. Um, so Mary's uh, intellect and will. So so here we have her her intellect, her knowing, her heart, her will, are, are completely, are com completely open to, to divine, to, to divine grace. So here we have, she is completely 
vulnerable to divine grace. You know, the, the, the sword that pierced Jesus' heart pierces her own heart as well, and she freely wills to be to be pierced with suffering like God so, so she can receive this grace of union with God. So then we have the relational dimension of the Imago Day in Mary. The whole of Mary's powers and being, all of her intellect, will, her whole self, through being open to grace, is actively <clears throat> engaged in imitatio Christi. So, so here's the cross, and Mary has patterned her entire her entire life on on the cross. It's it's the the pattern the um, the <coughs> model for her um, and actively engaged so her passion is an action uh, she is is willing she is knowing Christ and she is willing to imitate Christ she is not simply um, simply um, like a uh, dead thing being picked up and, and plucked onto the cross, she is she is um, fully uh, fully uh, desiring to follow Christ all the way to the cross, and we see this in her standing uh, at the foot of the cross. Uh, the communal dimension. We see this in Mary's heart. So her heart, as we saw, it, is completely open, and her whole being is completely open to divine grace. And because her heart is completely open, open to, to the suffering Christ, she has willed to receive that sword, and she, and she is standing at the foot of the cross. She, so her heart is, is open to Christ, and therefore, she also holds in her affections all those for whom Christ suffers and all those who suffer with him, being united with them through her union with Christ. So this is what we saw, what we saw before, that um, this same sword which penetrates the mother penetrates, penetrates my heart and your heart and everyone's and this means that that Mary's heart is also open to us it doesn't just go go um, go one way she um, she is um, is receiving us through receiving Christ because we are all united with Christ. Um, so in this way, her imitation of Christ extends to imitation of Christ's uh, kenosis, which is the human, I'll repeat this, which is the human manifestation of Christ's return of love to the Father through the Holy Spirit. So in Christ's 
Again, this is all an expanding of um, Philippians 2, 5 to 11. In Christ's self-emptying, his kenosis, which is his humiliation, He descends so that he might, he, he empties himself so that he might, through his, uh, through his resurrection, be, be lifted up. And actually, he's lifted up on the cross to, um, and, and through, through that, um, through, through his resurrection, it's, it's, it's revealed that he came from the Father and returns to the Father. So, so Christ's kenosis is, we remember that the Paschal mystery is, is a unity. Christ's passion yeah. And his resurrection, ascension. These are all one. So the kenosis, the humiliation uh, that Christ undergoes in the Passion is the necessary prelude to his exaltation. So, um, so this all. This is all um, the human manifestation of Christ's return of love to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And it's through Christ's humbling himself in his incarnation and, and passion and death that he is able to lift us up and return us uh, to, to the love of God the Father and elevate us in a new way to share in divine life that, um, that is even greater than what we were capable of at creation. This is why we sing at the, um, at, at, um, in the Exotet, as I think either uh, Dr. Hittinger or Dr. Meyer was speaking of, the uh, Felix Culpa, uh, or Felix Culpa, uh, oh, oh, happy, oh, oh Happy Fall. So going back to the, um, to the uh, communal, um, the communal dimension, of, of the Imago Dei, just to to repeat and confirm what I said a, a few moments ago. So, the communal dimension of the Imago Dei is ex exemplified by Mary because it's through her openness to Christ, through her being, again, it's on the other board, but I'll write it out again. Um, I think it's, um, oh, I had it. Is it 23, I think, particularly open? Yeah. yeah. So through her being particularly open to the sufferings of Christ, her heart becomes open to everyone who is in Christ. And this is, in fact, how we are to imitate uh, the communal dimension of the Imago Dei in our own suffering, through our suffering, opening our heart, um, not just to everyone else who suffers, but opening our heart more deeply to every human being who has been redeemed by Christ's suffering, because suffering gives us, as John Paul says, in so many ways, an, an intimate knowledge of, of Christ that we um, that we would not experientially have if we did not suffer. It doesn't mean that baptism isn't enough to save us. It doesn't mean that those who don't suffer um, don't know Christ. But there is a difference between um, between uh, knowing something without having experienced it, knowing something with having experienced it. Um, and uh, and 
uh, that, um, and you know, this is this is why um, why it's it says uh, in in uh, one of the uh, Catholic uh, letters. Um, maybe someone can someone who's better with their Bible knowledge than I than I am can can uh, identify the very son though he was he learned obedience through suffering. It doesn't mean that God in his in his knowledge didn't know what suffering was but but um, but that uh, but that Jesus gained an experiential human knowledge where it's his eye who was suffering uh, that um, was not the same as the knowledge that he had uh, in his divinity and um, because Jesus had that knowledge then in our own uh, experience of of suffering, when we receive knowledge of suffering, we are in some sense sharing in Jesus' own knowledge of suffering, and in his knowledge, it's always, um, there is always love, love of God, love of, love of the human person uh, in God. Um, so this last consideration leads to the conclusion that, um, that John Paul, I. Uh, John Paul's teaching in Salva Future Dolores um, not only develops the teaching of Gaudium, it's best concerning the communal aspect of the Imago Dei, but it also develops the Council's teachings on how Mary, in her roles as mother and mediatrix of graces, reveals how through Christ and in Christ, the riddles of sorrow and death uh, grow meaningful. I um, haven't had time and won't have time to speak about the Council's teaching on Mary as mother and, and uh, mediatrix. If you're looking for that teaching, you will find it in Lumen Gentium, which is in. Um, Lumen Gentium uh, 62. And uh, John Paul um, says, um, but John Paul says elsewhere, um, it's actually in a homily, that Mary is the most perfect example of how the purifying, tra the purifying flames of trial and sorrow have the power to transform us from within by unleashing our love, teaching us compassion for others, and thus drawing us closer to Christ. That's actually in John Paul's um, homily. You can um, find this through the Vatican website, and if you have trouble finding it, I can send a link to Dr. Hittinger who can send it to you. But his homily, at the LA Coliseum, September 15, 87. And I'll reread this passage. John Paul says, Mary's, Mary's the uh, most perfect example of how the purifying flames of trial and sorrow have the power to transform us from within by unleashing our love, teaching us compassion for others, and thus drawing us closer to Christ. So, John Paul, by reflecting in Salvafici Dolores on how Mary's suffering brings her into a greater experience of communion, is uh, facilitating a deeper understanding of Mary's spiritual and universal maternity. It's her transparency to Christ that enables his light to shine through her. And in this way, uh, she's revealing suffering in Christ as an opportunity for radical availability to divine grace. Uh, now, I realize I've given you a whole lot, but I just want to point out to you, um, I just want to point out to you um, very briefly in this last um, 10 minutes that we have, how Pope Francis builds upon this. And um, this is all contained in this book, 
I, which I know you've all uh, been given a copy of. And uh, it's particularly in um, chapter three, Sharing in Mary's Grace of Memory. I don't explain it there in the theological way that I'm about to explain it to you, but all the source material for what Francis says about Mary is in chapter three of Remembering God's Mercy. So uh, with John Paul II, John Paul II is, um, is uh, oh, could you please uh, erase that forward once more? Sorry to, to keep uh, working you. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, uh, sorry? I got to go to pick up my kids. Oh, I don't okay. need to jump on. I'm leaving. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Because in, in Asian uh, customs, king, the god, king, and teacher. That's why we don't. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I hope I see you later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, so what what we see is is that uh, John Paul, in um, in discussing the uh, the Imago Dei, is is focusing on what we would call the the faculties of intellect and will, which are, which refer to knowing and loving. Um, Francis brings in something um, very interesting. He, he's not changing the teaching on the Imago Dei, but he shows how the image of God is manifest, made manifest um, through, um, through another faculty, which is traditionally considered uh, a faculty that uh, is part of, well, in Augustine, this is part of how we image God, um, memory. Those of you who are familiar with Augustine's De Trinitate um, uh, on the Trinity know that uh, Augustine uh, draws uh, a parallel of the image of God in the human person between um, the human person being able to, to, to know, to will, and to remember. Um, now, Augustine's uh, understanding of memory is um, different from um, from the way we normally talk about it in the sense that he's uh, speaking of memory not just in terms of of what we remember but in our very uh, ability to remember and in um, everything that our um, memory um, contains about about ourselves whether or not we're actively calling it up at any moment um, and so uh, Francis is um, at uh, heart, I think, uh, in many ways, an Augustinian, as as was um, as was uh, uh, Pope, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict, and uh, Francis also uh, is familiar with uh, the idea of um, connecting gift of self to the offering to God of the image of the Trinity within oneself, the memory, intellect, and will. That's, uh, that's in the uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola Sushi Pay prayer, which Francis, as a, as, as a uh, Jesuit, uh, very likely prays every day. Uh, it's in chapter one of Remembering God's Mercy, I talk about it. It's the prayer that begins, take, Lord, my entire liberty, receive my memory, my understanding, and my whole will. And in Francis's writings on Mary, which you'll find in chapter three of Remembering God's Mercy, uh, Francis, um, Francis uh, has, um, one can find the structural dimension, relational dimension, and communal dimension of the Imago Dei in Mary's use of memory 
So if we look first at the structural dimension of the Imago Day in marriage, Um, uh, Mary, um, Mary uh, remembers God uh, with with love. So Mary with love with love. So she calls him to mind. We see this. We see this in, in the in the um, in the that magnif Magnificat. Um, Mary is remembering God, remembering remembering her. He's he, she's uh, she's speaking about how how God has um, fulfilled the promise He made to uh, to our fathers. So Mary remembers God with love and. And through this, she, and through this, she, um, therefore, turns. She turns her mind toward him. Um, and so she's a. Uh, she's seeking. Um, we could say she's seeking the vision of God. She wants to to see him, to know him. And she turns her will toward waiting on him, the whole the handmaid of the, of the of the Lord, the handmaid waits upon upon the master. Um, she waits upon him um, in her earthly life uh, in hope. Uh, even in the um, in the midst of suffering. So so uh, you know, she's so we have here love. We have. Faith, hope, and all and all these things are um, evident of the structural uh, Imago Dei as as uh, manifest by Mary through through um, the the vehicle of memory, and then in the relational dimension. Francis. Yeah, this is all Francis. And this is all you won't find it written out in this language in my book, but you'll find the backing for this in my book, the um, writings of Francis that um, that uh, that reinforces. Is there a specific Francis document? Uh, um, there are many, and I I quote them all in my book. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you'll find. Yeah, they're all footnoted in my book. Um, so, as as we mentioned, Mary um, Mary is is um, engaged with the mem with the memory of God. Uh, You know, we, we saw that in the um, relational dimension, the intellect and will are engaged in knowing and loving God. Mary is engaged with um, with remembering God, remembering her. You know, here we have the uh, the um, famous. Uh, um, uh, the, the famous image that you might have seen—it's a very bizarre picture of the 
of the um, of the uh, of the uh, large sized woman looking at them in the mirror at a thin sized woman looking in the mirror at a large sized woman looking in the mirror thin, you know uh, you know it's um she's remember she's remembering God remembering her and in, in that sense um, if you take the Augustinian understanding of memory as not just specific memories but memory as the foundation of our identity um, she is receiving her whole hermeneutic her whole perspective on herself through through uh, seeking to know herself in God find her identity in God um, and the communal uh, dimension is that, um, and, and this is this is the most interesting part that I uh, go into deeply in remembering God's mercy. Yeah, communal dimension of the other day. In bringing her personal history to God, I'll repeat this, in bringing her personal history to God via her act of loving remembrance, Mary, even as she suffers in union with Jesus at the foot of the cross, is drawn to remember the love of God that encompasses all peoples at all times, and to await with patient longing the fulfillment of salvation history. So we have the cross, we have we have Christ suffering on the on the cross. We have we have Mary standing at the foot of the cross. She is she is engaged in a in a union of of heart and mind and memory uh, with with God and she is remembering let's see she she is I'll just draw Moses on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. She is remembering all the works of God. Uh, and and uh, so uh, and she's remembering God's God's love. That it's this same, this same love, this same beating heart that encompasses all human history with its love. And so this brings her own heart to beat and to await with patient longing that day in, in, the, in the future when uh, when the uh, when all, all salvation history will be will be uh, fulfilled and when that sacred heart will will reign in every human being's heart and this and <coughs> the way that Francis has this this is this is all through um, the image of God in 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 Mary. Um, here we have the communal dimension. She's she's um, she's engaged in loving those who are in Christ and in and in um, and in loving them through um, through remembering in a. Um, in a pro, you would say, proleptic kind of uh, remembering, I think. 
because because she's understanding that that uh, she's only seeing part of the big picture, but that in God's memory, God's memory includes includes the future, the big picture that gives Christ's suffering and her suffering, everyone's suffering. Uh, so. Uh, I know you, I'm sure you all have questions, but I'll be very happy to to, uh, to answer after after lunch. Um, this um, I just want to emphasize with you that um, that this material that I've given you from Francis, uh, it, it really is in Francis, and it's not uh, just um, it's not just me. Um, Francis says that he's speaking of the, of, the, of the Magnificat. He's saying, this canticle of Mary also contains the remembrance of her personal history, God's history with her, her own experience of faith. Um, and uh, he's, when he speaks of the, sword, of the prophecy in Luke, he says uh, of Mary, uh, the prophecy of the sword piercing Mary's heart, Francis says, she bore in her heart throughout the pilgrimage of her life the words of the elderly Simeon who foretold that a sword would pierce her soul and with persevering strength she stood at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Excuse me, what page is that? Um, what page is that? That's, um, oh, thank you. Oh, that's, that's very good. Um, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and he, uh, and he goes on to say um, on page 54 um, that, um, that uh, Francis says, uh, uh, with regard to Mary's pain at the foot of the cross, um, just as her pain was intimate enough to pierce her soul, so too her joy was also intimate and deep, and the disciples were able to draw from it, having passed through the experience of the death and resurrection of her son, seen in faith as the supreme expression of God's love, Mary's heart became a font of peace, consolation, hope, and mercy. Uh, and then on page 55, um, Mary's, Francis says of Mary that she knows the way to healing in Christ, and he says, and for this reason she is the mother of all the sick and suffering. To her we can turn with confidence and filial devotion, certain that she will help us, support us, and not abandon us. She is the mother of the crucified and risen Christ. She stands beside our crosses, uh, and she accompanies us on the journey toward the resurrection and the fullness of life. So all, so all these things that I'm saying about Francis, it really is not just me. It is in Francis. I've uh, simply uh, synthesized it. Well, thank you uh, so much for, for, uh, for your uh, attendance and giving me this great opportunity to share this with you. It's certainly a joy for me, and I look forward to answering your questions after Mass. <laughs>